There's also an entire segment of one book where David is just <laughs> his pants while he walks through the woods, but yeah, let's not talk about that one. This is the introduction song. It's not very good, but it's not too long. All right, so, uh, Everworld. Now, this series was written by K.A. Applegate, the same woman who wrote Animorphs, and it also came out around the same time as Animorphs, and it's not talked about all that much. Like, uh, around, uh, oh wow, it's been almost six months now. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, around six months ago, I released my Animorphs Was Weird video, and in that one, I was kind of just making fun of how, yeah, Animorphs gets really odd and kind of stupid at points. And I didn't really talk about how it is a good series and it does get really dark considering it's aimed at kids. Um, and in the comments of that, as well as in my own head, I was thinking, you know, talking about Everworld would also be kind of fun because in a lot of ways I feel that it's kind of Animorphs' older brother. You know, it's, uh... Animorphs was no picnic to begin with, mind you. It gets really dark. It talks about war crimes, and there's horrendous violence in there, and PTSD. It's it's really dark. And then Everworld is darker. It gets it gets so much worse at a few points. It's like it's not exploitative. Don't get me wrong. It's just whoa that considering this is aimed at basically teens, whereas Animorphs is aimed at kids, they could get away with even more, and Animorphs got away with a lot to begin with. So, a anyways, there's a lot of similarities between the two of them beyond that, though. Like, just in terms of the way they're written, obviously, because they're written by the same person, and uh, the plot structure. And th I couldn't really think of a good way to tackle this series, like Everworld, what went wrong, or anything like that. So, I think with this one, I'm just going to try and do a discussion of the series as a whole. Uh, I've recently reread a couple of them, but not the whole thing, admittedly, but I remember it pretty well. And I'm just going to talk about, like, the general idea, what it, what it does right, and what it does horribly wrong, and maybe try and figure out why it's not really remembered and talked about the same way Animorphs is. So the premise of Everworld is really fascinating to me. Because uh, it's basically that idea of bringing all the different mythologies together into one world. Um, what it is is that all the various mythologies and gods, so like Norse gods, Egyptian, Greek, Celtic deities, all them, uh, they were originally on Earth. They actually lived here, but then they fled for whatever reason and created a whole new world, a whole new dimension, which they call Everworld. And uh, they also took along with them a bunch of their human worshippers, and uh, magical creatures like fairies and satyrs and mermaids and all that sort of thing. And one day, uh, four teenagers who are all connected to a fifth teenager named Senna, they all just get dragged into Everworld at some point, and they don't know what's going on, but now they're stuck there, and... Well, well they're sort of half stuck there, because when they're awake in Everworld, they exist in Everworld, but when they go to sleep, they their minds sort of wake up in the real world because <clears throat> their bodies are still there going around living life normally and every time they you know go to sleep and wake up in their new bodies it uh they get all the memories from everworld so it, they it's basically there's basically two of them one existing in each world and they both know exactly what's going on it's a little confusing but after the first book it's it's pretty easy to follow so when they're there for a little while, they learn that their friend Senna, or friend Senna, I'll get more into that in a little bit, but uh, it turns out that Senna is a witch, and she was actually pulled in to Everworld on purpose by Loki, you know, the Norse god of mischief and destruction and all that, and, and he brought her in specifically because he wants to leave Everworld. And at first you don't know what it is, but you know something dangerous is coming, and later on you find out there is this being called Ka'anor, and they refer to him as the Eater of Gods. And I believe that it's mentioned the gods actually originally fled Earth because they felt Ka'anor was coming. And, well, the name is pretty self-explanatory. You know, he is this powerful being who, I don't know if they can actually are able to kill him or not, but they are mostly just afraid of him because he comes in and he eats gods. <laughs> it's, uh actually kind of horrifying. We only see him do it once, but it is really horrifying and it makes sense why they would want to just get away from him. And so Loki brought Senna in because uh, her witch powers allow her to 
move things between Everworld and our world, or the old world as they call it, and he just wants to escape, along with all the other gods that feel like coming with him. But the main characters don't care about that all, mu all that much, at least not at first, because they're mostly just concerned with finding Senna and finding a way to escape from Everworld. So the majority of the series is just them tracking down Senna and trying to find a way to escape or trying to escape from other trouble uh, or re-tracking down Senna because Senna kind of escapes from them multiple times. Because like I mentioned before, she's not really their friend. So the plot here is kind of structured similar to Animorphs where most every book is more or less episodic, but they all tie into one uh, overarching plot line. And unlike Animorphs, this one doesn't really have as much filler in the middle. Because as much as I like Animorphs, it's a long series, and there's mm, at least ten books in there that really didn't need to be there because they don't advance the main story at all. But Everworld, uh, every book does have its own adventure, don't get me wrong, but the kids do make some progress in their quest, and every one. And, uh, well, the, the main characters are another area where this is kind of similar to Animorphs, but man, it gets so much darker, because, like I said, they're, they're older characters, because this one's aimed at teens. Like, Animorphs, I, I believe the characters in that were, like, 14? I actually don't remember. But in this one, they're closer to, like, 16 or 17. And so... They actually do make references to sex, they make some kind of off-color jokes about race and uh, sexuality and stuff like that, and they're old enough to have more world experience, so they have their own problems. Like, uh, the first one, the main, or the closest thing to a main character the series has is uh, David. And David is connected to Senna because he is her current boyfriend which also allows her to manipulate him a lot easier, not just emotionally, but with her magic, because that's one of the things she can do, is she can get people to... I'm not sure what the word for that would be, but she can get people to do whatever she wants magically. It's kind of awful, but we'll, again, we'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, but anyways, David at first seems kind of like a standard hero dude. You know, he wants to help his friends, he wants to help everybody that's nearby, he's kind of a obsessed with doing the right thing, but to him the right thing is usually just being practical. Uh, in fact, when the group has disagreements, David is usually like, hey, I want to do, I want to save people too, but we can't, so we're just gonna have to cut and run, like, that sort of thing. But, despite that, he is still really obsessed with being a hero, and for the longest time, it seems like that's kind of all there is to him, but as the books go on, you learn, oh, he was molested as a kid, and so that's why he's obsessed with trying to save people, because no one saved him, and he didn't save himself, so... Huh, all, all right then, that's... That's <laughs> that's not something they would have gotten away with in Animorphs. I should mention that this is also written like Animorphs, in that uh, every character, or every book is told from a different character's first-person perspective, and each character gets at least one. Like, Senna gets one, uh, I think David gets three, and all the other characters get two. So we get into each of these characters' heads, is what I'm saying, and we get to know them all really well, same as Animorphs. The next uh, major character is Christopher, and he, at first, just seems like a jokester clown dude, but after a little while you realize, oh, okay, he's he's like this because he's really lonely, and when he makes, like, off-color jokes about someone's race or sexuality or something, it's because he's trying to keep some distance between them. And uh, he's also Senna's ex-boyfriend, which is how he's connected to her. So he also is more under her influence than uh, most people are, but not quite as much as David. Uh, but, you know, she does still cast spells on him and stuff later on. And... Basically, he is, like I said, lonely and kind of purposeless, and he is afraid that he's going to turn into an alcoholic like his parents, so his humor is just a way of <clears throat> trying to deal with <clears throat> a really shitty lot in life that he feels he's been drawn. And just like David, he can get really cold and callous at times, so, you know, he's not necessarily a super likable character, but you 
understand 100% why he does what he does, and you understand where he's coming from, even when he's being kind of a dick. And then the third guy is Jaleel, who is uh, the only black guy in this group, and he has uh, OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, like he has to constantly clean himself, uh, <laughs> at least in the real world. In Everworld, his disorder is gone, which is why he kind of likes being there. But he's connected to Senna because in the real world, at one point, she can use her magic powers to make his uh, disorder go away and clear his mind, and it was great, but then she demanded that he be her servant, basically, if he wanted to keep it, and he told her to fuck off, so that's how he knows her. And he is the smart one. You know, again, this seems kind of... A lot of these characters seem like archetypes, you know? That you have uh, the stoic, or maybe not stoic, but you have the hero dude who always wants to do the right thing, you have the clown, now you have the genius or the brain, whatever you want to call him. But just like the others, Jaleel is a lot deeper than that. Like, he has more of a moral compass than them, and since he's black, he does have a different perspective on things like racism and stuff that they're in, or that they experience in Everworld, and he just absolutely refuses to be controlled. So even when they uh, team up with gods and such in Everworld to try and find Senna or whatever, he is always trying to make sure that they stay as far on the edge of any alliances or anything as they can, so that they, way they can just cut and run whenever. And just like the others, you always understand him, you always understand what he's doing. And then there's April, who is uh, Senna's sister, or half-sister rather, because her father uh, actually cheated on her mother and that's how Senna was born. But, and April is probably the simplest one, that's not to say she's bad, but she's kind of just really nice and she's not stupid or anything, she's good at uh, mediating conflicts. Uh, and she's a little full of herself, but it never gets too bad. Like, out of uh, those four, I would say uh, she's the most likable. Or actually, no, scratch that. I, I would say Jaleel is the most likable, but April never really does anything too awful to anyone or suggests doing anything too awful to anyone. So I will give credit to her for that. And, you know, her books are pretty good as well. And then finally we get to Senna, who is probably the weakest of the main cast, because she gets uh, dragged to Everworld halfway against her will, and then while she's there she notices that her magic powers are just a lot stronger, and so she decides she just wants to take over Everworld and rule everything. And that's kind of all there is to her character. She's evil and power-hungry, she's willing to torture and murder people, and that, that's kind of it. Like, even though we get one book from her perspective, that book doesn't really go into any sort of detail about what sort of person she is beyond that. I went on about the characters a little longer than I intended to, I apologize, but... You know, it's kind of like Animorphs in that every character is unique and every character has their own moments to shine. Uh, but unlike Animorphs, this one is a little bit less focused on like fighting and destroying the bad guys, because that's not their goal for the most part. Their goal for the first couple of books is find Senna. Like, the first book is literally called Search for Senna. Uh, and once they find her, it's like, okay, we gotta find a way to make her bring us back to our world. And then they run into trouble along the way there, and they wind up getting caught up in some wars between gods, and Ka'anor is coming, him and his uh, Hetwan allies. Hetwan are like... There, there's a couple of races that they refer to as aliens because they didn't come from our world. They're not part of any of... Earth's mythologies, they came from some other world, and Ka'anor is one of them. But because they're mostly focused on surviving, they aren't really badass warriors or anything. They are they mostly use their wit to get out of situations. Uh, one example being how they managed to get this pocket knife made of this substance called Kuhatch steel, and basically it's just super magical steel, like it'll cut through anything, and it will never dull, it'll never rust, anything like that. But it is just a pocket knife. It's basically like this, or hell, maybe even smaller than this, which, even if it can cut through anything, it's not going to be that useful in a fight, but they managed to use it to do stuff like uh, cut down trees and uh, escape from dungeons and stuff like that. So th they, they use their wit, is what I'm saying. Uh, they also, at one point, I wouldn't say they invent electricity, but they give electricity to the societies there, and so people start... Uh, embracing it and using it to create telegraphs and stuff. And in fact, they actually 
go to Atlantis at one point and they meet another guy who's also from Earth who has created a whole bunch of technology. Like, that's how Atlantis is such a technologically advanced place is because it's led by a human from our world. And the way he got there was there was a nuclear explosion. And I don't know why K.A. Applegate loves the trope of a powerful explosion sending people back in time and or to another dimension, but she does love that trope. But as I said, they're going through all these episodic adventures and the main plot is advancing. Uh, the big one being Ka Anor, like I said. Uh, like at one point, uh, they become friends with a god named Ganymede, who is a Greek one. He's a, one of Zeus's lovers. I'm sorry, my hair keeps getting in my eyes. I'm really not used to having it at this length. It's really ridiculous and obnoxious. But uh, anyway, yeah, they see Ganymede get eaten by Ka Anor, and that's actually one of the moments where Christopher really changes <clears throat> really changes his tune because at first he is you know like I said just the clown he's kind of an asshole but after that he really changes because he was friends with Ganymede and he had to hear him get eaten alive so after that he's like you know what let's I'm gonna chill a little bit and also while all this is happening Senna keeps uh, sort of pro astral projecting herself back to the real world and she does that she's able to found a cult uh, and, she's, and so in the second to last book she brings a militia cult of neo-nazis into the world with modern weaponry and she uses them to try and take over and um well <laughs> i know the series isn't quite as weird as as uh, animorphs but there are moments like that that happen there's also an entire segment of one book where David is just shitting his pants while he walks through the woods, but eh, let's not talk about that one. So then we get to the last two books where, like I said, Senna brings in her army and starts taking shit over, and the characters realize, okay, we have to stop this, and so they kill Senna. At the end of the second to last book, they kill her, and they run off, and so, like, her army is still there, but now they're leaderless. And because they killed her, in the last book, they, um they're no longer in both worlds anymore because Senna was sort of the thing that was keeping them connected to both. Um, they're still, their minds are still going back and forth a little bit, but when they're in the real world, parts of their bodies are like fading away. You, you know, like their hands will fade away while they're looking at them and they realize, oh, we're being pulled into Everworld completely. So if we're gonna escape, we need to escape now. But then they realize, yeah, we, we aren't going to be able to. We, we can't escape. We're just, we're stuck here. We're going to have to do that. And some of the characters are fine with that. Like I said, Jaleel no longer has OCD while he's there. Uh, David really sees an opportunity to make a difference in Everworld that he didn't feel he had in the real world. You know, he wants to be a hero and he doesn't feel like he can. And Christopher, well, one, he has a girlfriend in Everworld now. And two, he just feels like... Uh, the old world had nothing to offer for him. You know, he was just going to turn into an alcoholic. And so, okay, I can understand why they'd stay. And April kind of just doesn't really have a choice. And also, she doesn't want to face her parents since she's the one that actually killed Senna. So, you know, it works out pretty great. Um, and so they decide, okay, we're going to unite Everworld uh, before the Senites and Ka'anor can join forces, because they probably will. We're going to have to destroy one of them and then go for the other. So they go down to the underworld, rescue Thor and Balder, who were in prison there, and then bring them back. And they're deciding, yeah, we're gonna get, we're gonna bring all the gods together. We're gonna defeat the Senites. We're gonna defeat Kaanor, and then everything's gonna be great. And I remember the first time I read the last book, I kept reading it, thinking, wow, they're really gonna wrap this whole thing up in a hundred pages. Wow, they're really gonna wrap this whole thing up in thirty pages. Wow, are they really gonna wrap this up in ten pages? And then it just ends, like. It doesn't have a bad ending, it has no ending. Like, the, the last page is just a newspaper clipping from uh, Chicago, where the main characters are from, and it just describes how all the kids went missing, and it might be connected to Senna, because Senna also went missing at the beginning of the series. And, man, okay, I know the reason why the author did it this way. The author, K.A. Applegate, was writing Everworld and Animorphs and uh, Remnants all at the same time. And even though she was utilizing ghost writers, she was still having to uh, outline these, these uh, pretty, pretty in-depth. She, she was making very in-depth outlines. And, well, even with ghost writers, that's a lot of work. 
And she was also doing like spin-off books like the Megamorphs, and she was releasing sometimes multiple books in one month. And even though they're not that long, it, that's a lot of work. I get it. She was overwhelmed. And so she's like, okay, we need to end Everworld early. But this, is, this isn't even a crappy ending. This is no ending. Like, had you just put it on hiatus for like six months or something, and then come back with at least one more book? You needed at least one more book. Because you, you can't just end with, okay, we're gathering up an army to fight the bad guys, and then that's over. Like, th that's just, that's no ending. I, I know I keep saying that, but that, that's not a bad ending, that's no ending. See, Animorphs also has a pretty controversial ending, I should say. <clears throat> and I don't like it personally. Like, I've read uh, K.A. Applegate's defense of it, and I see what she was going for, don't get me wrong. I, I understand the message she was trying to send, but... I just feel like she prioritized <clears throat> sending a message over writing a good story. You know what I mean? So it, it just feels like, really? That's it? That, that's how you're going to end it? Alright, that's disappointing, but it's not the end of the world. Whereas Everworld, like, we didn't even get an ending. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't even... I, I guess you could maybe make an argument that it's ambiguous, but it, it just feels like there's nothing there to me. That's really upsetting, because Ka'anor was kind of a cool villain. We didn't actually get to hear him talk or anything, we just saw him at a distance as he was eating Ganymede alive. But it was kind of cool, the fact that literal gods are afraid of him, and they, they're very hard to kill. Like, they're not impossible to kill. Like, a god can kill another god, and artifacts of a god can kill another god. Like, in, in uh, the first or second book, they try and kill... Uh, the Aztec god, Huitzapoctl, unpronounceable. Uh, they go with a bunch of Vikings, I mean, the main characters. And they have Mjolnir, Thor's hammer, and they're able to use that to actually n not kill him, but they're able to sever his arm and he can't heal it. He's permanently maimed after that. And so, like, you know, gods can die. They're not totally immortal, they're just mostly immortal. But the fact that they're afraid of this dude makes him really scary and powerful and really cool, but we get very little of him. And then we get very little of the Senites, even though Senna is gone, they were still a threat. And we don't get to see the main character's arcs wrap up. So this is immensely unsatisfying. Okay, this is one of the worst endings to anything that I've ever come across. Like, if we're just talking books, <laughs> this would be up there with, uh, the two endings of Fallen. Like, because there's kind of two. There was the ending of Rapture, which was the core series, and then there was the ending of Unforgiven, which was the spin-off, which is kind of sort of a sequel to the main series. Those are both awful. Don't get me wrong. Everworld's ending would be up there with them. And if you were to go outside of books, there's plenty of, like, TV shows and stuff that have had just god-awful endings that I would compare this to, or even say this is worse than, because this just misses... This doesn't miss the point, this is this misses every point that you can possibly miss, and I genuinely think that this is why Everworld is not really remembered um, all that much nowadays, even though Animorph still is, because, like, like I said, written by the same person, they came out around the same time, and uh, uh, granted, part of it is probably that uh, Everworld was aimed at an older audience, like Animorphs, was aimed at kids, so you had kids reading it, and teens, and adults can kind of read it and still enjoy it nowadays. Whereas Everworld, kids were kind of left out of that one. In fact, I didn't read this until I was like uh, 13, I think, was when I first read the books. And, man, I, I don't even know where else to go with this. Like, the characters are gathering up an army, making alliances to defeat the bad guy, and then it's over. Like, we don't get to see them fight him or anything. We, we don't even get like a flash forward to an epilogue to five years later where everything is fine now. Like it's not great, but everything, there aren't, there isn't an existential threat to the world anymore. And so, um, yeah, I don't have a whole lot else to say. You know, Everworld is a really solid series in almost every way. There's a couple of little issues I have with it uh, here and there. Like I said, David spends the better part of an entire book shitting his pants at one point. Seriously, why, why, why would you... Why? I don't get it. Um, and a few of, of the bits with the gods while, while they were trying to show off how evil they are just felt kind of edgy rather than dark. 
Uh, not all of them, but a few. And, like I said, that ending just really takes away from most of the enjoyments I feel when I remember this series. Because, <clears throat> imagine if Wheel of Time ended without showing the last battle. Like, it, you would feel like everything up until that point was kind of a rip-off. So, um, yeah, I don't have a whole lot else to say about Everworld. It was a really good series for the longest time that I read as a kid, and even though it's similar to Animorphs in a lot of ways, I just don't think about it all that much. And uh, I think that's a damn shame. And I think the window for actually making a proper ending has passed by now. Like, it, the last book came out almost 20 years ago. I don't think that K.A. Applegate really feels like crapping out one last book so that she can just say, look, it's finished. I, I don't think she feels like doing that. And yeah, it's just a crying shame. I don't have any real thesis beyond that. Thanks to everyone for watching my long-winded ramble of a book series that ended 19 years ago. Thanks especially to all my patrons and my $10 and up guys, Apo Savalainen, Alex Humba, Ashley Watson, Ava Toomer, B. Quinn, Brother Santotis, Christopher Quinten, Elize Violet, Emily Miller, Evan Stegall, Joel, Johnny St. Clair, Madison Lewis Bennett, Ronnie, Tobacco Crow, Tom Beanie, Topher Wheeler, Vacuous Silas, and Vavictus. All of you are the best. I would not be able to do this without you. And also, everyone who watched this far, you're amazing. Please like the video, comment on it, and subscribe if you haven't already. Uh, all that stuff I'm supposed to say at the end here, you know how it goes. Anyways, uh, 